The following podcast reflects the views and opinions of the hosts and guests only. They do not reflect the views or opinions of any agency or specific members of an association. At times, colorful language may be used and may be unsuitable for people under the age of 18. Discretion is advised. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the PPA podcast. I'm Steve Graham is president of the Las Vegas Police Protective Association. Uh, my normal sidekick, Dan Coyne, is not here. So we actually have the honor of having a, a good friend of mine that we've worked together uh, pretty much our entire careers. We followed the same path. We've worked patrol together. We worked in narcotics together. Uh, we came up to the union about the same time. Uh, he is one of our biggest assets. Uh, whenever it's related to use of force, he is our go-to guy. So welcome to my dear friend. We're going to see how often he doesn't laugh or curse during this show, Brian Yan. <laughs> yep. Howdy, everybody. I'm Brian. Nice to meet you all and glad I'm on here and uh, should be a good show. It's going to be a good show. We got uh, Adela, what are we at? Uh, Seven million followers now? At least, okay, seven, and, it, and then that ticker's still rolling. Uh, but uh, this show's going to be dedicated really to a, a, a couple topics. One, we're going to talk about the football game. Uh, May 6th, 6 o'clock, Bishop Gorman High School, plenty of tickets available. VIP tickets are starting to run a little low. Uh, but uh, that's going to be the crux of the, the show today. we got a couple players. we got one of our main fire folks. we got our quarterback from the police team that uh, I'll remind everyone again that led us to a 34-0 to route of the firemen last year, uh, hoping for a little bit of a change this year. Then we're going to bring on one of our committee members, uh, Seth Stokes. Uh, it's so important that we got this committee involved so that we could fundraise in the proper way. Last year was very grassroots. Brian will recall that I kind of had a challenge for everyone on the board. They had to bring in a donor, right? Yep. And you guys were quite resistant to going out and uh, getting donors. It was donors. Uh, quite, quite tough, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, going knocking doors and trying to solicit uh, donors when everybody's like, what's this about? Why have we never heard of this before? And... Where's the money go? That's always a big question, and it was very important that it stayed here. It stayed with the Police and Fire and then Children's Heart Foundation. So Yeah, um, and then we're going to get into uh, Top Cops, which is in a couple weeks, actually the week after the game. We're going to be in D.C. Brian is our uh, NAPO representative, the National Association of Police Organizations, and he's the one that crafts the Top Cops nomination uh, where uh, Tierney was our recognized top cop, and good job on that. And Brian's going to talk us through how that process works and kind of what goes on in Police Week back there. Yeah, yeah, you know, it, it, it's good. It takes a lot of time. Uh, it, it, it's a good process to recognize cops, not, not only here, but every state across the nation gets to nominate somebody. So we'll get into that in a little bit after we deal with the main good part, the football game and how much fun it's going to be, how much money we're going to raise, and uh, getting a good turnout there. Yeah, so uh, Adela, our uh, fire and police officer ready, they were in the Rolex room uh, getting their watches, and uh, I think they got their goodie bag from Tiffany for the wives to bring it home. So if they're done, we can go ahead and bring them in. Are we good? Thumbs up? Yep, we're thumbs up. Good. Okay, so we're going to come back with Sean Riley and Dylan White with the football teams. Did I get that wrong? God damn it. <laughs> Fuck you, Dylan. <laughs> We're going to come back with Sean Riley and Dylan Height from the Fire and Police team. It's going to be a good interview. Stay tuned. All right, everybody. As promised, we have uh, two of our stars from last year's game uh, for uh, Police and Fire. We have Sean Riley and Dylan Height. Thank you guys for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having us on. Yeah, happy to be here. Just remember, not like Ricky Bobby, like Sean said, don't do this with your hands. We just kind of keep them in our laps, and unless they have something to occupy themselves with, uh, then you just keep them down. Uh, so I uh, wanted to talk to you guys. Uh, both of you have played football before you were hired on as fire and, and police. I uh, want to talk a little bit about your background, a little bit about uh, how you got involved with the football game and what it means to you and the other players that you're with to be able to play in the game for our charity. So I'll start with Sean. Uh, our quarterback, and uh, talk a little bit about what uh, what your background in football was, what brought you to police work, and then uh, the football game, and then what we can look forward toward this year. Um, so I'm originally from Orange County, California. I uh, grew up playing high school football out there. Just started off as something to do in the fall. Just started playing. My dad said, you got to do something during the fall. Uh, picked football. Originally, was just going to be a kicker, and then started throwing the footballs around, and they asked me to play quarterback. And so... Uh, my career started out there in Orange County, uh, out of high school. I was 
highly recruited out of high school. Didn't kind of get the offers I wanted to out of high school. So I played a year of junior college football. And then that brought me out here to UNLV. Um, I was out here from 2011, 2013, uh, during the Bobby Houck era at UNLV. Um, proud two win seasons, you know, we went, <laughs> we went strong at times and everything, but, um, so that pretty much was my football career after that, um, had some tryouts with the Canadian teams. And then after that kind of bounced around in the arena football league with Arizona, Iowa, Portland, went down, went around with some teams. And then, um, at a certain point in my life, um, I kind of had that Peter Pan moment where I had to grow up and get a real job, you know, <laughs> and stuff. And so, um, I like giving back to the community. Um, police, I've always been interested in doing it. And so I was out here in Las Vegas. It's always been a, my new home, I always say. Um, originally from Orange County, but I love the Las Vegas Valley now. So I applied for Metro, got hired on, been on for about three and a half years now. And then last year when you guys sent out the email about the football game, I thought, why not give it another go, see if the arm can still can still sling the rock around and everything. And uh, just came out and, and loved it with the guys. It was a it was brought back that team mentality of the football and kind of messing around with other the jokes and all that and kind of getting ready for the football team. So uh, you and I talked, I think last week, um, you're a pretty good punter, right? Yeah. Like you, you, that was probably something you may have gone and, and done uh, rather than the quarterback position, right? Correct, yeah. I was, I was recruited more highly as a punter than I was as a quarterback. I mean, it was, it was in terms of like – SEC for punter, but then for a quarterback, it was more like pack. It was pack ten. I don't want to age myself, but it was a pack ten. <laughs> that that type of thing. So um, probably a better decision to go that route, right? You punt for ten minutes and then you go hang out in the locker room, right, for the next two hours. But so I can tell everyone I haven't seen him punt yet. Uh, I'm interested in seeing you punt. We talked about it, but it was toward the end of practice, and I was gonna say, hey, let's let's see you kick one. Um, but we don't want to uh, hurt the feelings of our punter, Zach Adam, our SWAT guy. Uh, so we'll let him keep punting. But I do got to see you kick a ball because someone getting recruited at SEC to punt, it's probably a pretty serious foot on you. Well, I just don't want to take his job with him being the sniper. You know, it's not the best person <laughs> to take his job, right? So um, I'll, let him, I'll let him keep that job. That, that's know. probably smart. He's also pretty <laughs> yoked, too. I mean, we saw the guns that were out on him last week, and uh, I don't know uh, what ageless men's health he's going to, but he's looking pretty yoked, pretty yoked. <laughs> pretty yoked. <laughs> Uh, all right, Dylan, what about you, buddy? Well, uh, not not as exciting of a football career, but we'll uh, we'll start it here with uh, being born and raised here in Vegas. Uh, grew up here, went to Centennial High School, played football my whole life, um, played in Centennial, didn't play in college, so I don't have as uh, crazy of a story as you, but during high school, um, being seeing that I wasn't going to go play sports in college, I joined our Las Vegas Fire and Rescue Explorer program, and I saw a lot of similarities in playing sports my whole life, teamwork, brotherhood, sisterhood, um, you know, doing things for others. Um, so I was like, well, let's let's try to go for a career in the fire service, and that's what brought me to being hired with LVFR. Um, a lot of the same things that we did playing sports, we do at the station. I mean, everything's a team. We wash the rigs together. We even play sports together, and ultimately here I am when I heard the opportunity to uh, get back out and play any kind of sports. I mean, I play with our softball team, played on the soccer team, but football was my main sport growing up. So getting the opportunity to come back out here and play football again, here I am. So, Question for you. So uh, I was an explorer for Metro when I was 16. Um, so what was that, 1995? Um, were you born in 95? <laughs> 97. Established. Son Greatness was established in 97. <laughs> All right. Uh, but uh, so I know how important that Explorer program was to young kids looking to get into police work. How, how important was the Explorer program for you, getting you ready to be a, an actual fireman? Oh, it was huge. Um, I mean, I'm a direct product of the program. I knew nothing about the fire department. Um, hearing everybody around me when I was working my construction laborer job, fresh out of high school, you got to know somebody, you know, you're never going to get hired. And I can definitely say that if it weren't for that program, I wouldn't be a fireman today. It gave me all the tools to succeed. It gave me every path, you know, go get your EMT, do ride alongs, understand the culture, understand, you know, what the fire station lifestyle is like, what it's like to be a fireman. Um, and ultimately it put me in a really good spot once I did get hired and 
thankfully I got hired with LVFR. That's where I was an explorer at. All my eggs were kind of in that basket. Um, it was very successful in my academy and downtown at Station One now, representing, running the calls, doing the thing down there. So it's kind of kind of a dream come true, honestly, being an explorer for five years with our department and then getting hired here. So it's huge. Where's Station One at? Station One is down specific address 500 north casino center drive but uh we all like to say it's down at fremont street so okay so that's the one just past the overpass right yep right on the other there, side right back where we you, Fremont. back where and we'll age ourselves back where we used to go to court underneath the freeway <laughs> yeah, yeah at city yeah, court city court yep yeah. yeah so all right uh playing football to both of you you kind of back and forth this thing but what's it mean to the guys that uh probably thought they'd never played this sport again at least competitive tackle football um, to be back out there and playing a sport that, listen, we all wish we could be kids again, uh, but we can't. Some of us are older than others, uh, for sure, in this room. I'm not the oldest one, uh, but, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, I'm sure we all wish we could go back and do things. And, uh, you know, what does it mean to the guys to be able to do this again in the way that we're doing it? You know, it's not half-assed. We don't, you know, hey, we got a Nerf football and a pair of shock pads, and that's what you're going to play in. I mean, we take this thing serious. So what's it like for everybody out there? Um, well, I'll start with the police side. Um, I think last year, I think a lot of guys came out that were reluctant to play because they didn't know how serious it was. And I think we approach it from our side. Um, I I'd like to install a college style offense. That's what I tell them. And so we started off with the basics, the walking, showing them a route tree, understanding everything going on with that side of it. And so from the football side of it, I think a lot of people, they like, they saw the growth in themselves and they realized, yeah, they may have only played till high school or something like that, but the college level is not much different. It's just, it's a little bit faster. There's maybe a little bit more tweaks here and there, but I think, I think the major, the major thing was game day. Cause I think from what was provided on game day, I think was a, a huge step up than what most high schools, right? I mean, most high schools you go play, if you're the away team, you're going to the girls' locker room. You know, you've been wearing your jersey all day. It's smelly, all that type of stuff. And I know when we showed up to to the actual locker room, we had all our stuff laid out for us. It was, it was like a professional locker room. There was waters, Gatorades. Um, we had a whiteboard with all the times, everything we were doing. And I think a lot of guys were surprised with how professional that side of it was. And so I think a lot of guys like seeing that side of it because most people's career, they it ends in high school. And then from there, it's just you're just showing up and you're just you're just playing at that point. But I think with how professional this game was and the backing and helping that you guys did for this game on that side of it, as long as the fundraising too and all that extra stuff that you guys have to deal with, kind of that side of it, I think for people was an eye opener. I think. What about you, Dill? Same thing. Um, you know, kind of come into it thinking that uh, it's just going to be a, you know backyard football game and then we got there last year and it was it was done well I mean everything was was laid out for us we had our locker room set up we had trainers that were there to tape us up um I mean stuff on the field equipment everything is very professional and that opened at least for the fireside being that the result was what it was last year you know I'll, I'll just rip the band-aid off quick you know um, this year, there's been a lot more interest. A lot more younger guys want to come out because, you know, ultimately they saw what the score was, and we're here to try to make a change to that this year. So and I got I, I don't really have a leg to stand on, but we're we're going to try to make a change to that. So listen, at the end of the day, it's it's fun to compete, it's fun to play uh, the game, but we're playing for a reason, mm -hmm. right? And on your guys' side, um, mm -hmm. what are, what are you guys playing for? What's the charity that you guys are playing for? So we have uh, the PFFN, Professional Firefighters of Nevada, and uh, I know one of the huge things that we've been raising money for has been a memorial that's going to go up in Carson City. Um, there's a big memorial being made, and I think it's, I don't have the exact date, but it's going to be revealed later this month. Um, just a bunch of statues and a wall with guys' names on it that uh, have passed away here in, throughout the whole state, not just Las Vegas. All the way up north, anywhere in the in the in the whole state of Nevada, so that's something that's huge for us. Um, for me personally, that that's huge. You know, it's a it's a big fire family. Um, you know, if if somebody goes, you go, we go. Um, we're here to support the families, whether it's on duty or off duty. 
it's one big thing. And uh, having that wall made for the guys that paid the ultimate sacrifice is huge. So raising money for that, I think has been, I mean, to be a part of it and being somebody who can say that I had a hand helping with some of that, it's, it's, it's an honor. So. Yeah. And from, from the police side, what are you thinking as far as the donations and the game and, and what it means to the police side, but as well, the community, um, in, in what we're doing and what we're giving back, what we're raising. Yeah. I mean, uh, we're playing for law enforcement assistant fund leave. Um, it's a great organization or it's a good fund for, for our fallen, fallen officers. Right. Cause, um, when an officer hopefully never happens to anyone, but when, when they do fall, um, you gotta think there's, there's a family behind that. Right. And so I think with leaf, it's, a, it's a great fund organization, however you want to, however you want to word it, but that takes care of that family. And I know we've had a lot of discussions with it at practice, trying to instill that in the team and everything of why we're playing. It's not, it's not just for us going out and spatting up our ankles one more time and cracking some helmets and all that. It's a great, it's a great fun to make sure that families are taken care of on Christmas and birthdays. And, um, you think graduations, making sure that family supported and everything. I know we've talked about long term. I mean, how where you see the growth going and seeing about maybe helping the family out even till for colleges, mortgages, all this stuff, helping out that family. And I think that's a great, it's a great, it's a great motivation because we all don't like we we don't like to think of that happening and everything, but it's a real it's a realization of our Absolutely. jobs. You know, police, fire, mm -hmm. you never know and everything. And knowing that we're going out there raising money and seeing all the work that the PPA is doing and everything can fire doing to raise money for this fund. We're also getting the community involved as well with uh, all, all the TV spots, radio and stuff like that, trying to get community members out to the game as well. So that way people are coming, seeing police and fire in a different light. A lot of times with police, we're, we're being seen in the worst moments of people's lives here they're coming out enjoying some entertainment enjoying a good game a good environment this year at bishop gorman there's going to be food trucks and a lot of other things that people can take part of it, it's good to get the community involved and and some of the sponsors that we have getting their name out there to the community in a different light other than on tv or a radio ad and stuff like that big shout out to to our main event sponsor <clears throat> I know Eglet Law Firm is going to not like hearing this, but our main event sponsor is George Maloof this year. Uh, and Drink Aid, thank you so much to George and Drink Aid for stepping up and getting the naming right. So this year's game is the George Maloof uh, Police and Fire Charity fo Tackle Football Game. Uh, next year, we have plenty of people that are uh, wanting to jump on board. And w our next guest, uh, Seth, we're going to talk a little about that, about some of the friendly rivalry in the community, about people wanting their name attached hmm. to this game. Uh, and finding out a little too late that they couldn't do it, and George had already taken it. But uh, <clears throat> um, we're also playing for the Children's Heart Foundation. Um, and, you know, whether you guys know it or not, Sean, maybe you do, but one of our own players, their their child, has been a part of the Children's Heart Foundation, being born with, born with a heart defect, uh, that that group steps up and tries to support the family with uh, doctor care, housing, and things like that when they're going and getting those processes done. Um, how important is something like that? You guys are younger guys. Neither of you have children, right? Nope. Six-year-old. Okay, so um, what would that mean to you and for future for yeah, you, you know, yeah. to have a group out there that would step up and say, hey, we're going to help you out here? Uh, you, you got the kids, so you can, you can lead it off. <laughs> um, I mean, it's just a, it's another thing that makes you feel a lot better, right, when you know there's Absolutely. there's foundations out there helping. And I believe it's Cody, right? Yep. And so um, I know I talked to him a little bit about it and everything. And I think it's just knowing that there's there's people out there that care. I think that's the thing. Because, I mean, obviously you have kids and you just want the best for them, right? And any anything that can hinder their ability to be the best person they can be, yeah. you want to make sure you fix that, right? And so I think the Children's Heart Foundation and seeing there was kids on the field last year from the foundation, I think it kind of puts it in perspective a lot of the times when when you do see – little kids and they're so innocent you know and yeah and then here's here's this great foundation trying to help them out and so if there's more money we can raise towards them and makes it easier for them to do activities or however they want to use their money for the funds that we give them then i mean i'll be it you know and and so anyone that's watching uh may want to know so the children's heart foundation is our main 
charity, even above our own uh, with police and fire. So uh, 20% of all of our proceeds, they get that that nut first. And then <clears throat> we get kicked down. It's a 60-40 split, mm-hmm. right? The winner of the game yep. gets a 60 and the loser gets a 40. Yep. So what can we expect for this year, guys? Uh, I'm going to start with fire, and then I'm going to let the reigning champs uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, take up the tail end. And, uh, yeah. you know, what, what we can expect from the teams. Um, I mean, being, being that I played in the game last year, um, there, there was a lot that we could do. I mean, we could only go up from there. Um, we did a lot to try to incorporate more organization, getting more exposure. Um, the, the biggest challenge for the fire side is we have four agencies. So we got, for those who don't know, I work for LVFR. Those are the red engines. We got Clark County fire. Those are the yellow engines, Henderson fire, and we got Northtown fire. And so four different agencies that all do the same thing. I mean, we're all, you know, even police too. We all got egos. We all think we're, <laughs> we're the best at our own agency. So a, a big task <clears throat> for me kind of to get exposure out was making sure that I got it out to every department. And uh, I feel like I did a better job of that this year, which I think has helped our numbers, helped guys coming out to practice. Um, and ultimately the spirit. I mean, a lot of young guys are out there, which is what I kind of wanted. I'm a young guy myself. Um, and I, I just the energy is a lot different than it was last year. We have more of an organized plan um, and guys are more excited to come out. And I think, you know, I, I hate to say it like this, but, you know, losing in the fashion that we did, you know, it's kind of a pride thing. And it's kind of ex- exciting to see that some of the younger generation still has that pride. Like, hey, we want to come out. We want to make a difference. I don't know if we'll win, but you know, we're, we'll keep the game closer this year for sure. So um, that's kind of kind of where we're sitting. We've done a lot to prepare, practice schedules, got more guys coming out to practice. I guess that's, a, that's something I should bring up too. Our schedules are a little unique as well. Um, for fire, we work a 4896. So that's on shift for two days. We live there. We run calls out of the house. We have four <laughs> days off. So getting a good amount of guys to practice has been definitely a task. But we've kind of tackled that this year and had a better plan, and the numbers have been better. So definitely think we're, we're more prepared coming into it this year. Well, I want to give uh, you specifically a big shout-out because you took up the mantle, and Adela knows this, uh, with getting everyone organized, with getting your team together, with you know putting it to them. Hey, listen, are we in or are we out? Are mm-hmm. we playing this game or are we not playing this game? And, mm-hmm. and you made everyone step up. Uh, and I, I really hope that your folks and whoever's listening to this on the fire side understands – how much Dylan put into this for the fire side. It's easy for us because Brian and myself, Adela, this is our full-time job, not football, but the union is our full-time job. We don't got to go work calls for service like you guys do. Mm -hmm. Um, And even Sean, I mean, Sean put in a lot of time with text messaging players and that, but we kind of get a lot of it going. You didn't have that support system, and I'm not knocking anybody. No, not at all. But you're out there working – you're still doing your thing. You still got your regular day-to-day live, and you're trying to get practice. And so also, so people don't understand, this is not they. They get 10 hours of their shift. They yeah. go play football. No. They're finding time on their own time to get out there and do this for the community. So uh, you should be proud of your effort, buddy, because I can tell you from last year to this year, and again, not knocking anyone, uh, the effort and the involvement and the fact that you stepped up when mm-hmm. you had so much other things going on in your life, uh, really helped us get to where I think this game is going to be probably the biggest game that we've ever had. Absolutely. Uh, and and I thank you, and I know my team thanks you, and all the fire and all the community should thank you as well. So good job, man. Absolutely. If there's just one thing, I just uh, take a lot of pride. I love being a fireman. I love my department. And uh, I just want to share that message to all the other guys on the team. Shout out to all you guys that came out and uh, have worked hard with me. You guys still got pride. Sorry, the headset's falling down. Got pride in the job, and – that's uh that's something that uh we need to keep keep carrying on. So that's just kind of my piece. I'm happy to be here. That's why I took the lead on it, and uh, hopefully it's a more competitive game this year. Sean, what can we expect from your team? Your your uh, policeman. Um, I think kind of piggybacking off of what he was saying. Um, we obviously know more is going to come this year. That's what we keep preaching at practice. That yeah. um, don't expect the same team as last year. Not trying to knock the team or anything like that, but. Um, with how serious you've been taking it because we've been hearing how you're getting a lot better numbers at practice. Um, I think we have too because I think we have a lot of new guys that are stepping up in, in key roles and everything. And I think um, the first the first couple of practices I said to the team, right, like accountability. 
I think that was our main thing this year because it, it is hard. Everyone has schedules. Um, obviously, we don't have the schedules like you, but um, when you got the jails that work the 12s, you got DTAC, some of them work 12s and everything. It's hard getting people out at practice and getting them all organized and everything. So um, I think we've done a lot better job this year with having a better show out at practice. Um, I think this year, if we're probably... I think we're probably further ahead. I mean, you're kind of like our head coach. I mean, you probably see it a lot better than I. <laughs> I think we're a little bit further, further Coach along. Steve. Coach Steve, we're uh, we uh, we all pitched in. We got him uh, armbands, and so he's gonna be Burt Reynolds in the long yeah, guard. Yeah. So yeah. Nice. get ready, get ready for we, that play. We nice. have we have one practice where I throw a pass, and all of a sudden it's oh, you should play. Like you're out of your mind. There's zero chance of that happening. <laughs> zero but, chance. But yeah, I think I think we're we're. We're right where we should be, I think. I don't want to sound cliche like a coach or anything, but I think we we picked up where we were last year, and I think we built upon it and stuff. And I think we're looking good and everything, I think, coming up. Good. Yeah, speaking of coaching, you know, Steve uh, and I and his brother coached. Uh, so, hold on. Youth. I didn't coach with you two morons. <laughs> well, I, you, was, you I, was on, I was on a team that had elite players, and we you had, guys. We had elite, too. Listen, yes. Six. <laughs> Six, seven, eight, you know, all, all the way up. I think we stopped when they were about nine years old. But Steve's brother and I, Brian Grammis, coached uh, the NYFL Patriots. And we were lucky enough to have a great team. And we went to the Super Bowl one year. And it was 0-0 going into overtime against the uh, 49ers. Um, I was a defensive coordinator. Brian Grammis was the worst <laughs> offensive coordinator you can imagine because it was 0-0. My defense did a great job. We didn't give up any points till overtime. The offense, uh, different story. It was like, you know, the, the old Cleveland Browns, because I'm a Browns fan from Ohio, but they'd run the same play over and over and over again. Metcalf up the middle, the smallest running back you could find, run him right up the middle, get maybe negative two yards every play. That's about what BG did. Um, in overtime, we got, I don't know, we had five yards, and then uh, BG called the same play on fourth down, and it's in our own half, and I'm like, what the heck are we doing? We are gonna, we can't do this. Did it. <laughs> yep. Get your defense out there. You better stop them. First play, <laughs> yeah, little, little fast jet sweep, touchdown, game over. We lost the Super Bowl. He blames it on me. I blame it on his offense and lack of play calling. But coaching's, coaching is a good part, and, and you – Sean, being the quarterback, you're the leader of the team, um, and at least on the offensive side, and like you said, the accountability portion, and, and with the fire side, I remember last year going to some of the practices to do the the helmet fittings and stuff uh -huh. like that, mm -hmm. and you'd have like two or three guys there, and I'm like, holy cow, yeah, wh where where are these guys at and stuff like that? So that that's huge, just like you said with police work and firework accountability being true to ourselves and making sure we're doing the right thing all the time. That's a good message that goes back into the community as well. We're accountable. We're here. We're, we're doing the right thing all the time. And we're here to interact with you. So great on you guys for being the leaders and, and pushing that to the troops and, and the players because it, it's very important. And a shout out to uh, Level One Athletics. Uh, they're the ones that did our uniforms for this year, getting our helmets, getting our shoulder pads. Um, so big shout out to them as well as a lot of other people that we'll talk about when Seth comes on. Um, but, but one thing that I'll, I'll comment on about how I know I'm not the coach and we'll talk about last year's game. Um, so, um, we started the game and I tried my best to not be involved, but I've coached, uh, football for a long time. I played since I was five. Uh, and so I saw an opportunity. We threw two incompletions in a row. Sean couldn't hit his target twice. Guys were wide open, and he just overshot them. It was windy. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. And I said, hey, we're punting. And he looks at me and says, no chance. Keep the offense on the field. I'm going for it. I said, well, I'm not coaching anything. And then what did he do? He threw like a 30-yard touchdown strike and <laughs> figured it figured out. But it was a lot of tutelage from me. Like I showed him how to throw. I uh, showed him how to drop. Um, he was really raw. I don't know what UNLV under Coach Hawk was doing. He was a special teams coach, I believe, at Montana or what. So he was more focused on the special teams. Uh, but you were you were just like a you know a, a piece of coal, and I turned you into a diamond. And I'm so proud of how you've evolved uh, as a player and I, as a person. I think about that every night, like <laughs> you, you where, know, where I was last night or last year and everything, and yeah. to where I am today. No doubt. Know. And uh, to to anybody who is listening to this or watching this, um, to our what's that seven point nine million our seven point nine million <laughs> followers. When you're in town, you may get pulled over by. Uh, are Sean Riley. And if you mention 
the football game and that he's your favorite quarterback on the football team, that it may get you out of a ticket. I don't know he'll be in those motor boots and on a motorcycle, but it may possibly get you out of a ticket. So it's worth at least throwing out there. I, I don't know. I he don't can't know say that because he's, he's so know. new. He doesn't want anyone in his chain to go, this guy's not writing tickets. What's he doing? We got a job to do in traffic. Stats. That's right. Write them tickets. Uh, hey, uh, really appreciate you guys coming on the show. Hopefully you had fun. Um, May 6th, 6 p.m., uh, VIP ticket. We'll get you in there at 3. The gates are open just to you. The guys will be on the field. You'll be able to interact with them, take photos on the field with them, as well as the food and drinks, unlimited all you can do up in the VIP, plus photos with hopefully some celebrities that we get through there. Uh, but uh, to both of you, the game doesn't happen without having two teams, and you guys really put these guys together. So thank you so much. Appreciate you. Up next, coming out of – oh, do you guys have the Rolexes on that you got, or did we we went against it? No, I just wanted to keep my G Shock. Nice. It's okay. Yeah. Smart. A, smart move. Because we don't. For six, six we don't. Years. We don't want him to get robbed. So when you go out in the lot, keep that in your pocket. <laughs> Give your ticket to the valet, like Sean <laughs> told us about the uh, the unhoused valet guy we have out there. And uh, we'll be back with our committee member Seth Stokes. Stay tuned. All right. Great segment with uh, two of our players from the big police versus fire football game. But the game itself is one arm. The other portion of this game is the fact that we need to raise money for our charity. Uh, last year, we kind of just went on a whim and said, hey, let's just try and contact businesses on our own. I think we were fairly successful, uh, but probably not super successful. And so this year, we made the decision to form a committee. And one of the folks that was eager to jump on the committee from the very start uh, was our next guest, Seth, Seth Stokes. Uh, very happy to have you on today, Seth. Thank you so much, Mr. President. <laughs> I am uh, happy to be here. So it's going to be a good time. Seth, uh, Seth's going to talk a little bit about uh, how he got involved with the PPA, uh, his love for the police department, um, some philanthropy, and then how we move into the direction of this game on May 6th. So, uh, Seth, if you want to unload on everybody, give a little background on who you are and uh, you know how you got tied in with some knuckleheads like us, and we can go from there. You got it. So uh, I moved out. I'm from originally from Texas, East Texas. Uh, I grew up in a small town uh, called Kilgore. Um, and I moved out here. I, well, after college, I got into healthcare biotech. So and I moved around a bunch. And I moved out here to Las Vegas in probably 2005, 2006. And absolutely fell in love with the place and said, I'm never leaving. So um, from there, we started, you know, we've always tried to, to get involved in some way to to give back to the community, so to speak. So um, we got involved with uh, the IPOF first and Mindy Lloyd and those guys. And then from there, we uh, I met you at a, I think it was a political action committee meeting. And we started trying to get involved with the PPA as well. So uh, it was, it's been a fun road. Yeah, so far, so good. Uh, shout out to the Injured Police Officers Fund and Mindy Lloyd, another one of our committee members. I love the work that they do supporting our officers too. So, uh, yeah, we we met at a at a pack event, mm -hmm. and uh, it was it was very easy to tell that you were probably one of the more enthusiastic folks about supporting cops. And at the time when we met, there was a lot of uh, uh, rhetoric about police officers mainly trying to say we're the bad guys, right. and the criminals are the good people, and you know that's kind of where we brought everybody in. You right. tell them a little bit about some of the pack events that we did and some of the stuff that you've been doing with us. Yeah, so uh, you're exactly right. There was a kind of a political spectrum in this country that was, you know, saying, calling for defund the police and all this nonsense. Well, you can't have that, obviously. So you can either sit on the couch and get mad or you can get involved and do something about it. And that's what we did. So um, from there, let's see, we started, I mean, if you, if you want to talk about getting involved in philanthropy in this country, sure. um, <clears throat> America... American citizens are the most generous country there is, bar none. We're at the top, right? So, And that stems going back to kind of the guys that built this country, John D. Rockefeller, uh, Andrew Carnegie, um, J.P. Morgan. You know, those guys were in a big competition with each other to see how much money they could acquire and how much wealth they acquired. Well, later on in life, it became about how much they could give back. So then they all started to get involved in philanthropy, get their friends involved in philanthropy, and that's where it stems from. So fast forward to present day, you have these guys, like thank God for these guys, like George Maloof and Robert Eglett, and Preston Rose, you know, that, that will open up their checkbooks, you know, from a text or a phone call to get involved and, you know, give us what we need. So shout out to those guys for sure. 
And we've got a goal. Brian, what's our goal for this year's uh, game? Yeah, 250 or more. I mean, last year it was quite, like you said, very grassroots, and we're going to business, handing out flyers and, and, and doing that. And on top of our additional normal day-to-day -day work, it was quite stressful. And I, I can tell you um, the initial approach at, at the first game and the fundraising, mind-blowing and like, oh, my God, this is never going to work. And how the heck are we going to pull this off just like everything else? we always end up doing, but to have you on board and the committee to help guide it and take a lot off our plate right. so we can do all the behind the scenes stuff for the football game and set up and all that to take care of the players and everything. It, it's amazing. And, and the work that you and the committee have done and the vision, I, I think this game's only going to grow bigger and bigger into the future. And I personally can't thank you enough for all the work that you've oh. done because it's so much easier for me because <laughs> my normal workload's crazy, but you're taking a bunch off of our plate, so I, I appreciate it. Right. Well, there. Uh, before I get too big of a pat on the back, there's a. I, I told a lot of people there was a uh, there's a, a good cop list if you donated, and there was a bad cop list, and your name went on it if you didn't donate. So, plus you guys might have to let some people off some tickets. Uh, if they get pulled over, they were told to say they donated, and they were getting out of the ticket. And if they uh, if they didn't donate, well, you know, you might getting be on double. a bad. I hate a bad. I hate <laughs> cops list. So. <laughs> like, yeah. So we got double what we asked for. I'll tell you, we, uh, you know, between Adela and I, you know, you are, Adela and I talk about this a lot. I appreciate everyone on our committee, uh, Marilyn Kirkpatrick, Victoria Seaman, Mindy Lloyd, uh, everyone that's on there, but you have been so active just going out and putting our posters in, hold on, grab one of our posters so everyone can see. So this, this poster here was created by you. Yeah. Right? Kind of on a whim. Adele and I didn't even really know what it was. And then all of a sudden we get a text for it. And, uh, you know, if you're watching this, take your little phone. I don't know how this QR stuff works. I think you just point your screen at it and it sends you, like, alien info. But this is uh, this is the QR to get tickets. But this, was, this is going to be popping up in businesses across the city. Right. And primarily that's because of you. Well, you know, you get out there and you just door knock. <clears throat> and you talk to these businesses about what this represents, right? Leaf, PFFN, Children's Heart Foundation, it becomes an easy sell. So, and these guys in the community, they want to get involved, you know, so they want to show their support to cops too. So it's it's not a hard sell to just at least put their poster up, you know, yeah. with businesses. So I don't get a lot of no's out of that. You, yeah, you haven't had a lot. Uh, we, I don't think we've had one person that you've told us said wouldn't do it for you. Yeah, so... And, and to give, you know, to talk about guys like Robert Eglett, you know, we, I sent him a text with that poster and your narrative. And this guy, you know, he's a busy guy. Like, he's, he's a tier one lawyer in the country. So within five minutes, I get a phone call from him immediately. It's like, hey, what's going on with this game? Tell me more about it. What's going on? Who's got the title? And I was like, well, the title's already taken. Maloof pulled the trigger on that first. And he goes, you know, he used some color for language, <laughs> but he goes, uh, let's make this happen. Um, I want it next year and every year after. There you so, go. So, and I was like, well, uh, I'm sure if you write the check, it's yours. So shout out to him again, man. He, uh, he always makes it happen. And to what Brian said, you know, those are, you know, we have, we have contacts in the community, but we don't have those contacts and we wouldn't have that door open without folks like you and the rest of the folks on the committee. Cause we yeah. don't know those folks. You know, they know us as police, and, and people may know us from, you know, the uh, the RJ or the news pieces, but you don't have that type of relationship uh, like someone like you does uh, that can say, hey, need some help, and, and they'll get involved. Yeah. Uh, it, it means a lot to us. Uh, like Brian said, you know, we, we're working seven days a week with what we do, um, right. dealing with, helping our officers and doing everything for them. So to be able to count on good people to help us out and drive – the fundraising on this thing has just been, you know, you can't even put words to it. It uh, It's easy when you have guys on your team also, um, like you were saying, Mindy and Victoria, uh, Wayne Jeffries. You yep. know, he, he knows a lot of people in this town. He makes a lot of the same calls. And, you know, people want to get involved. They see what we're doing and they want to get involved. So it's it's pretty exciting. I'm excited to see how big this thing is going to be this year. Now, this isn't, you know, this, it's not like you're retired. Uh, you, you work. You know, what do you do for work in the community? Right. So um, I 
you know, I try to run a business, but it, uh, you know, it's try the work, it's work in progress. Um, <laughs> I work in the biotech sector, like I said, so I know a lot of doctors on that side. Um, I work in the legal sector as well. So I know a lot of a, like for healthcare funding type stuff. So I know a lot of the PI lawyers in town. So it's kind of a, a doctor lawyer mix. So a lot of those guys like to, they understand what we're doing. So it's easy for those guys. Plus they have, you know, they got some pretty big checkbooks. Sure. So it's, uh, it's easy for them to get involved and open up their checkbook and, you know, thank God for them. So now, Brian, what do you think uh, this, we just had the two teams on. What do you think the spread for this game should be? And then we'll defer to uh, Seth and see what he thinks the line is going to be posted at for this game. I would say police are going to give up, um, say, 17, a safe number, police by 17. All right, half of last year's score, 34 yeah, 0. Yeah, I think Fire's <laughs> going to put a little bit more effort into it, a little bit more pride, and take it a little bit more seriously. Um, I th unless they bring in some ringers, I, I think our talent out outweighs uh, their heart. Okay, all right. Now, if I well, should, if I told, hold on, Seth, if I told you the line was seventeen, what are you betting? Are you taking the points? Well, or are you giving them up? I. Uh... After seeing the video of last year, and I haven't seen any of the fire. I mean, you guys pulled the starters. It was thirty to nothing in at the half. And it was it was pretty close. Yes, yeah, yeah. pretty close to. So yeah, I mean, they didn't get on. They didn't get on the board. So I haven't seen any practices this year. I'm I'm sure they're going to show up a little more. Um, I'm not a handicapper. We got a buddy AJ that uh, does that stuff. So I'm going to have to defer to him. But if if we're going off of last year's video. Um, I'm taking I'm taking Metro for sure. All right, there you have it. So. Uh, Seth is uh, is taking the 17. Brian Yance on the record is saying his line is 17. Yeah. Um, and so Seth's take Seth's going to give up the points. He thinks that the firemen are not going to be able to cover that 17 uh, point addition for themselves. I have inside <laughs> information from Caesar Sportsbook. That's uh, that's <laughs> all what right. I'm getting right now. Yeah. You know, I'm pretty sure that Yance going to try and take Sean Riley, our quarterback, out to affect the line somehow so that he can he can win the bet <laughs> at all costs against me. So uh, we're, we're pretty sure that – I think 17 is a low number. I think it's yeah. a pretty low number. Okay. Yeah. I, I'd be I'd be willing to be in the, the uh, 21. So you're not calling off the dogs <laughs> this year then? Uh... Sean will let me. If I try and pull him out of the game, he won't come out. You know, uh, I try and get everybody involved, and he yells at me because he met, had an incompletion. Some power <laughs> you as a president have that – People don't even listen to you. It's listen, like, it's like us being parents. Same thing. Kids don't listen. Doesn't matter. Listen, I'm just concerned with when we run out of the tunnel. At, and big shout out to Coach Browner and everybody at Bishop Gorman. Like they have rolled out the red carpet um, to us to do whatever we needed to do for the game. Scoreboard, uh, headshots of the players music the little smoke and helmet that they can run through coming out at the beginning i mean it's 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 top notch right not to say last year it wasn't we had a great time at bonanza and i love our folks shout out to coach keith and all the good things he's doing with the youth in the community at bonanza high school uh which also benefits from this game from right. our standpoint because of who they are uh but where we were last year to this year um is just uh it, it's going to be miles ahead right. of what that experience is like Right. Well, I mean, how many followers do we have now? So this eight, is going out. 8.6. 8 8.6 .6 million now. Yeah, so. Since you've been on the show, it's jumped dramatically. I like it. I like it. Well, yeah. hey, we're selling. What's the VIP ticket going for? 150. 150 okay. bucks. And then we still have a lot of those left? Or we do. We, we have enough left, yes. We we need to fill that VIP area. Okay. So. And, right. it, and I think it's your friends that are going to be in there. I bet it is. Right? Closing it, it down. Be there. Yeah, if there's there's free alcohol and food, we're gonna we're gonna That's, close it down. Uh, the area that I'm gonna be working strictly, making sure nobody gets out of line. Yeah, you yeah. gotta have safety uh, and security yeah. everywhere, Brian. Yeah, I'm I'm definitely all over that. What uh, time are they kicking us out of the stadium? They're not. Oh. All right, <laughs> yeah. there we go. There uh, we go. Hopefully, to uh, shout out to Charles Woodson Whiskey. He has his own uh, whiskey brand that he is committed to setting up a stand and sponsoring and donating a bunch of whiskey on his behalf. So thank you to Charles and uh, what he does for uh, the community and his support for first responders. It's just going to be a, a, a top shelf event. Like it's, right. you're going to go Cinco de Mayo and have a great day. And then the next day it's going to be all about the big police fire football game. And yeah. if you're not there, 
you're nobody. Yeah, I, my entire family from Texas. Well, it's my daughter's birthday, so we're celebrating her birthday <clears throat> that weekend. Um, my entire family from Texas is coming out for it. It's going to be exciting. Love it. Love it. Yeah. Seth, thank you so much for being on the podcast. I know you're a busy guy. We know we got to turn you loose back to the community <laughs> to get us some more money. Uh, we're getting close to that that two fifty, that two hundred fifty thousand dollar number. Uh, but we do appreciate your support, not just for the game, but just support for law enforcement in general. I absolutely happy to help. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. Appreciate you. All right, next we're going to talk with Brian about uh, DC and Top Cops and uh, close this show out. So stay tuned. All right, big thank you to our committee member, Seth, a solid guy, uh, down-to-earth guy, and really driving our efforts for the fundraising, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. Guy uh, is rock solid, and, I mean, there's no way that this would be where we're at without him and the full committee. I mean, it was a great idea that you guys had to try and develop that and push it forward, and, I mean, that guy is out there every day jobbing it. No doubt, man. All right, so now we're going to talk about a little bit of a pivot um, into uh, Police Week, and it, it's so good that we have Brian on here because Brian is our main guy with NAPO. He's our main guy doing the um, awards nominations for incidents here. As you can see, we have this year's 2023 NAPO uh, salutes the Top Cops Awards. On the back of that program are our recipients. We have Arizona, Connecticut, Kentucky, Michigan, Nevada, Texas, Ohio, New York, New Jersey, and a federal agency. Those are the recognized top 10. They'll kind of compete-ish to see who's the number one. Yeah. And so, uh, Bri, talk to us through how we do the nomination, who NAPO is, who the top cops is, and, and all the way through everything that everyone would want to know about what goes on in police week next week or in a few weeks. Yeah, so NAPO's National Association of Police Organizations, they're basically based out of D.C. and, and Virginia area, but uh, all the major law enforcement associations across the country are involved in it. You got basically every state, but, you know, NYPD, all of basically Florida, all of Texas, which is humongous, um, Detroit, Boston, you know, the whole, the whole nine. It, people belong to that organization. It's a labor association and they lobby on behalf of the membership to the federal government on on different stances and issues especially the justice and policing acts and and stuff like that is you know so napo is kind of twofolded we also get a lot of good information information sharing back and forth with all the different associations what they're seeing contract negotiation stuff problems with discipline arbitration cases and stuff like that so it's a really good networking piece on the actual association side. Now, when you go to Top Cops, um, Top Cops is to honor the great work the men and women of, of our profession do on a daily basis and the sacrifices and things that they do for the citizens and the community within, within the U.S. So um, Top Cops itself, uh, it's a self-nominated uh, venture. Anybody can nominate an officer or an event from your organization um, to top cops. I do the nomination on behalf of the PPA. And basically, it's hard for me because all we really deal with is the OIS, is the officer-involved shooting things or the, the traumatic events uh, when, when an officer is severely injured or something like that. We, we go on all of those, so we know those. And, and you typically have a good handful of really good dynamic events where our officers do something heroic or are above and beyond saving a life or whatever. So we have those. We never really know all the true great events like our um, best of the badge gala and all them have, you know, for, you know, life-saving stuff, helping, helping community, helping families and stuff like that, because we don't always get to respond on those and our people don't tell us. So that's why, for me, it's important that it is a self-nominated thing. Anybody can nominate an officer. And in, this year, we had two, two guys self-nominate um, each other from our canine section. They, they did a submittal, and uh, one of the folks, uh, canine officer Berger, he's going back as an honorable mention, um, which he'll get to go back to the dinner, and it, it, it's, it's a great event. He's the officer that was uh, canine officer that was rammed in the all-around all over the valley pursuit with a carjacking and robbery suspect. There was two shootings where he had shot at the police officers 
um, during the pursuit and stuff. And then he got rammed at basically 70 some miles an hour and he's still injured today. That was one at Decatur in, uh, by the Blueberry Hill, right? Yep. When we had that torrential downpour right after, and, uh, it was crazy night of in Vegas, right? All that thunder and lightning and then the rain, everything got washed away. But yeah, thankfully he's, he's recovering. Um, but like I said, he, he's an honorable mention. Um, what I did this year is, you know, I, we had several, um, events that we could have chosen for our nomination. Um, but the one we did with officer Tom Burrow, you know, she was a warrior. She went out there and, you know, performed like we hope everybody would when they're injured, you know, did a car stop, got in a foot pursuit, started chasing after the bad guy, bad guy turns around point blank, shoots her, shoots her in the hip. She instantly goes down, shatters her pelvis, um, has the wherewithal and, the the guts and the courage to pull her firearm and fire she struck the suspect twice once right in the center of his back and the bullet lodged it right in the center of the guy's heart and he died thankfully um and he wasn't able to uh injure officer tumboro anymore and um ultimately he was taken into custody she she was taken to medical but i mean when you look at that event and we have body camera footage and it's you know graphic and scary but it's one of these things that is a true reminder of, of police work. Bad things can happen in the blink of an eye, and, and you don't get to choose when that's going to happen. That That's chosen by the bad guy, and we just have to react. And, and she performed awesome. And, you know, to watch that and to be able to nominate her. And, I mean, there's several other events that and officers that I would have liked to nominate um, that are very much deser- deserving and, you know, should be there. I think this was one of those ones where you see, you know, a young female officer, smaller stature, um, you know, going out there and really kicking ass, doing it um, and and doing it well, um, very well deserved to go back. And we'll, uh, you know, because we're trying to get this podcast out before the game, uh, we have another podcast with Tyranny where she was on here and we talked to her for quite a while and that should be out before uh, the top cops happens on on the twelfth, I think is the dinner, correct? Yes, yes. So we'll look forward. If you're listening to this one, make sure you pay attention to the next one because that one's going to be a, a really good one. It's her story, how she got in law enforcement, how she got engaged in that uh, that evening, and what happened uh, since then. Uh, Brian, what's the difference between a top cops with tyranny uh, nomination and the honorable mention? What, what's yeah. the difference? Yeah. So the selection process. Um, <clears throat> they try to get somebody from every state to be nominated. Um, and the nomination goes into the executive board of NAPO, um, as well as a large cast of civilian, um, counterparts, mostly actors, uh, comedians, um, all kinds of law enforcement supporters. And then there's some, um, federal, congressional men and women that that sit on the panel and what they do is they'll, they'll sit there they'll watch the body camera footage now because we have that in almost every case uh, they'll watch the footage they'll read the submission and they kind of narrow it down um, to the first selection around the top 25 that they think are the best of the best to move forward to a final selection of the top 10. Anybody that doesn't make the final cuts are an honorable honorable mention, and and they're taken, um, and they're able to come back to it. You get a certificate, and you get recognized in the program um, as an honorable mention, and your performance was heroic, and et cetera. But the top ten are the ones that go back, and they do a complete um, reenactment of it. They do a, a script where. Uh, a celebrity will read and narrate um, the event and talk about it and then bring the officer up on stage um, to receive their award and, and to be recognized by the crowd. And I mean, it, the dinner itself, the Top Cops dinner itself it, is amazing because last year we were there and I think every single one that was there of the top 10, you you, you could say they're all the best. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know how the the team, you know, from NAPO and, and their their folks that narrowed it down to pick the number one, the best event, because um, they were all a- amazing. And, I, I mean, you know, hopefully this year's the same. It, it's sad that we have to have, you know, 
tragedy and trauma and something bad happen um, to recognize what our people do every day in you know in, in this profession. Um, but I'm glad that we get that chance to do that and to have them back in in a setting with nothing but police officers and and their spouses and people that care and support the police and love the police to have that dinner and that event to honor people is is a great thing. And so the top 10 um once we know who they are, but no one knows who the top cop is until that night. I mean as far as us go that we go, right? Correct. Yeah, it, that that's kept and and held, you know, with the <clears throat> NAPO executive staff. Um, and that would be the final award. They would be called back up on the stage and and receive the final honor of the top cop um, for the year. And so people kind of understand. It's kind of like, uh, I guess, like the Oscars or Academy Awards. They name five people in the category, and then they name a winner. We're in the same boat where they name the top ten from the year, and then they decide a winner out of that, right? Yes. Yep. Have Have we ever had someone win the actual top cop? the number one chosen that you're aware of? Man, since we have been up here uh -huh. in since 2014, I don't think we've had yeah. one. And I, I'm not sure previous. I wish you would have asked me this so I could have done my homework to find out ahead I just, of time. It's, uh, we're not putting <clears> it. <throat> we're just, just wondering if it, you know. Yeah. It's, I don't, I'm the president. I don't know. I, I feel bad that I don't have that answer It's for okay. You. you weren't ready for it. It's all mm -hmm. right. Just trying to be off the cuff. Because I don't yeah. think... I don't know of us. I've looked at some of our awards that we've had uh, because we have them here from anybody in the past, and I don't remember seeing anyone that was the top cop. Yeah. You know, um, I know we were, we were close when Alan and Igor... Mm -hmm. Um, were killed, um, and we we did that nomination. I, I did that, and we sent a cadre of like twenty yeah. folks back. That was crazy. Uh, that was our first year. Yep. Um, I, I know it was close. I I don't think that since I've been doing it or been around uh, up here, I, I I can't give you that answer. Yeah. I don't. I don't think we have. Though. Yeah, I don't think so either. Um, okay, and so so the dinner happens. We get done. What's What's the environment like back in D.C. for Police Week? You know, you've gone many times, almost every year probably, um, and being back there. And what would you what would you recommend to a cop who's never been there and thinking about going? Yeah, yeah. it's it's something you'll you'll never truly believe until you do it. Um, if if you're a cop, you know the younger kids you know may not care so much right away. Um, there's some that have generations of, of law enforcement and stuff like that, and it would mean more. Um, but as you get older and you've done things and seen things and been through, you know, e events and, you know, we, we all experience different trauma, um, to see it is amazing to see nothing but cops walking around in super liberal DC everywhere, um, with police shirts and, you know, badges and guns and, you know, taking over the city for a week. It's, it's amazing. I mean, you know, the first time that we went, we went and we did the sightseeing and looking at all the monuments and, and just doing the touristy thing as well. Um, that's great and that's cool, but just being around, you know, brothers and sisters that have the same ideas and, and, um, mentality as you and, and feeling comfortable, um, it's great. And then, you know, the events, whether it's the candlelight, uh, police unit tour coming in, um, going to the mall and seeing the wall and all the names on there. Um, it, it's just something that you'll, you'll never be able to replace, you know, the feeling of pride and the knowledge of sacrifice and, um, what our profession has done um, for the country and, and, and for the people, you 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 wa walk away from there, uh, you know, being being proud, you know, proud of what we do a as a profession for ourselves, our family, and and everybody else. And then you also, you know, recognize the ultimate sacrifice that that's why we're here. 
we're here to make sure these people are always remembered and and thanked and um because like i said sometimes you, you don't get to pick the day sure it, it picks you see it, it's one of those it's unfortunate because you know we had our our fire counterpart on here and uh, those men and women can wear their work shirts out everywhere to the gym, the regular community. They they can tell everyone they're firemen or fire personnel, uh, and nobody bothers them about it. Uh, by and large, cops can't wear yeah. police memorabilia, have a sticker in their window of their car, wear a T-shirt to the gym because all of a sudden we become a target as opposed to somebody that's revered. Yep. And so it's uh, it's good to be back in D.C. for that one small, you know, four or five days where everybody is in the same boat, folks with their shirts on, their badges on. I mean, just they like you said, they're proud of their profession, and we wish we could do it every day. But, you know, unfortunately, society and the people that don't like the police make it very well known when you're a police officer and they know it and you're off duty that uh, you probably – aren't safe sometimes yeah, to even like, wear. Like last year, it just popped in my head and <laughs> makes me laugh. Uh, we were back there and we got on them scooters, the little Lime scooters yep. for the first time. And we were, I can't remember, we were, we were trying to go meet up with some uh, New York folks for, for a lunch. And we couldn't, our Uber couldn't even get us close uh, because of, uh, I think it was, it was a pro abort- rights or abortion, abortion protest. Yep. And I mean, they had buses and buses and buses of protesters that they were shuttling in, dropping them off. And, you know, they're all yelling and screaming. And here we are jumping on a, a little lime scooter and, and rolling past them. And there's tons of tons of uh, Washington folks and, and cops just standing there waving at us because we had our, our PPA shirts on and our badges. And, you know, just the brotherhood, they, they're laughing at us as we're trying to get the heck out of there to get get to dinner but they're out there doing the job keeping you know the protesters safe and and letting them exercise that right um it 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 was just crazy i remember that well scary first because i've never rode one of those electric scooters (laughs) i was like oh my god i'm gonna die (laughs) might have had a cocktail in here too but um yeah yeah no it was uh yeah i remember too so that that group was going into hotels and overtaking lobbies and stuff and uh, one funny story we learned was that there was a uh, police jujitsu uh, seminar of about seventy folks where their ears look like strudel and you know their faces are all busted up and they're all training, and they they hear the noise coming up the hallways and these people were going into ballrooms trying to overtake the ballrooms and uh, the story I heard was they pull open the ballroom for the jujitsu class and they stare into the room and see all these awesome savage cops staring back at them in their police shirts, but their strudel ears and their blood coming down their face. And the person at the door says, yeah, not this room. <laughs> Shuts the door and they go down the hallway and they say, nah, I'm not going in there. Uh, pretty pretty funny to uh, hear how that that mob mentality worked until they came across a, a new mob of their own that would have said, yeah, please come in. Yeah. We invite you. We welcome you with open arms. Yes. <laughs> come have some fun. Uh, I, I like having Brian on here because Brian and I have, uh, out of anybody that works up here, Brian and I have known each other the longest. Uh, do we have any funny stories of when you and I worked together long ago? I mean, we had the fireman on here that when I mentioned when I was an explorer, he wasn't even alive. So that that kind of hurt. So, you know, our our uh, time on here is uh, has been pretty long when you relate it to some of the cops that are on the job, but... <clears throat> I, I don't I, I don't know some of the maybe stuff some I, of the things you can't yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. you know I, As, I remember like a couple of weeks ago I, I i remember calling you and uh it was back when we worked for brent becker he was <laughs> he, he did my first officer involved shooting back in 01 in homicide then he promoted to sergeant and we were working together um and we would go in the mornings and play basketball. Oh yeah! After we worked graveyard and <laughs> George sobs, hairy chest yep. and belly, and you know he'd try and purposely get all sweaty and rub up on you to try and make you just let him pass by to get an easy layup or something <laughs> because you don't want the the hair and the sweat yeah, yeah. all over you. And yeah, shout out to George, you're nasty. Like you always smelled really quick. <laughs> Love you, but yeah, you. Yeah, wore it's them, like he like, never took a shower. He wore those dry fit shirts. And like the sweat, the bo just starts like instantly, and so yeah, he he'd get up on you, and it was it was some funky stuff. Yeah, and then you know riding together, and you know back then you had to 
finagle the car radios because sometimes the department shut them off and you couldn't use them and you know do you remember listen, when listen to country music and uh then three o'clock rolls around howard stern howard stern howard on 1075 man right. that that kept that kept you alive because you start seeing the pink elephants running down the middle of the road <laughs> on graveyard and you remember when Brent came in and uh, his entire side was bruised? Scratched up and bruised. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and he, bl he blamed us for <laughs> being down in the low block. I'm like, Brent, you're six seven. We're we're little. Yeah, but you guys are beating the hell out of me down there. Yeah. Look at my body. I think someone else was abusing him. He just didn't want to tell yeah. us. Yeah, yeah. that was all pleasure for him, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right, so uh, listen, I think we had a good show today, uh, a lot of good content. Thank you to our football players. Thank you to Seth. Thank you to B. Uh, my man by for being on here uh, a lot of you know him because he's out there repping you guys all the time um and so f you know for me to kind of close the show out like uh um you know we we here at metro and i've heard across the country a lot of groups have these wellness bureaus um you know really take advantage of those things because you know ptsd is a real thing dealing with uh family life and work life and you know trauma it's a real thing so if you have the ability to reach out to these folks and get some help do it. Uh, if you don't feel comfortable with them, call us. Uh, we'll sit down and we'll talk you through some things that you can do. But, um, you know, as we come into police week, uh, there are uh, folks that in our profession have taken their life. And, you know, we hope that that's not the first thing that comes to mind, that it's the last thing. And, uh, you know, if you are struggling with someone, call us. I had an officer uh, call me a couple weeks ago that was struggling with something and got them some help. So it makes us feel good that we can help a brother or sister out. But uh, please don't forget, take care of each other. Take care of yourselves. Uh, we thank you to our members for your membership. We thank the community for coming out to the game. We thank the sponsors that are involved in the game. We thank our 9.1 million followers. The number just keeps climbing the show. I don't know how it hasn't been picked up by – uh, the same people that gave Joe Rogan the millions and millions of dollars they did. But uh, soon enough, it, it'll happen, and we're going to donate most of that money, not all, but most of it, back to uh, uh, the PPA and LEAF. So uh, from myself, Brian, be safe. Thank you, and we'll catch you on the next one.